was a failure on the part of the United States Secret Service. It's important that we hold ourselves accountable for the failures of July 13th, and that we use the lessons learned to make sure that we do not have another failure like this again. We have to be very direct and clear with our state and local partners uh, as to what we're asking of them. Some members of the advance team were very diligent. There was complacency on the part of others that led to a breach of security protocols. Shot was fired at the former president. The former president was not exposed to where he was on the golf course. And what I've said, and I said this Monday, that the procedures work, the, the redundancies work, so that high level of protection is working. We are not capitalizing on a crisis. We are showing the math. We have finite resources, and we are stretching those resources to their maximum right now, which is gonna require us to replace these assets. It's gonna require us to also adjust. Well, they plead that they don't have enough money. What do they have? Well, the Secret Service budget has swelled to over $3 billion. But where's it all going? About 87% of that budget, or $2.7 billion, is directed toward operations and support, which includes $1.2 billion in funding for protective operations, the division that oversees protection for the president, the vice president, and their families. But where is the money going, the other money? Well, of course, the Secret Service has its own DEI, an accessibility program, complete with an inclusion and engagement council. And Steve Scalise pointed this out. He said, if you look at their budget since 2017, we've increased it over their own request every single year. So clearly they've gotten more money. It's about allocation. Well, their primary role is to protect the president and the presidential candidates. And obviously in this case, we see they failed. Last night, Ron DeSantis gave us an update on his own investigation in Florida, which will, uh, we hope, yield more answers than we've been getting from the feds. Is, are the feds being cooperative with your investigation? Are you concerned that you're not getting the information you need? No, they're not being cooperative. Yes, I am concerned. I mean, for example, uh, we were rebuffed, our investigators were rebuffed just going to the fence line. Uh, outside of Trump International Golf Club. Hopefully that tune will change, but I can tell you right mm. now, Laura, uh, we have not gotten a lot of uh, receptive, uh, receptive response. Joining us now, Charles Marino, former Secret Service special agent and author of Terrorists on the Border and in Our Country. Charles, um, do you yeah. think the Secret Service should be asking for more money right now? There's a lot of questions about how they're using the funds that they have. Yeah, fair point. I think what they need to demonstrate first is that they're using the resources they have effectively and that they're being put towards the greatest threat in terms of their protectees. Former President Trump faces threats that are off the chart. Uh, we know that our threat level here in the country is through the roof. They have to put this towards those protectees that need it most. We have a Republican nominee and we have a Democratic nominee. Those should be the two priorities right now. And I think you see that reflected today in what the House passed earlier today, enhancing the protection for these two candidates. Well, so they did, they unanimously passed a bill to enhance the Secret Service protection uh, for President Trump. Um, and in, in, the acting director was asked about the shift that he keeps referring to. And watch what he said. Yeah. With respect to the paradigm shift, uh, this is about uh, looking at the organization holistically. Uh, for example, the communications issue. Communications were problematic. Uh, and I think what, where I'm looking at is uh, we need to have communications that are more closely aligned to the operations. Okay, uh, Charles, this just seems rudimentary to me, especially after 9-11 when we had such a communication breakdown. So the local law enforcement and the Secret Service. Ideally, how do they interact? Because it broke down in Butler. Well, this is a well-proven method up until Butler, Pennsylvania. The Secret Service relies on the counterpart system, and that is you get everybody together that's participating in the overall security plan, and you make sure they're all on the same place to monitor communications and pass essential traffic to everybody on the ground to make sure they know what they need to know. 
And for some reason, I can't figure it out, and I don't, I don't think the Secret Service can, how this went so awry in Butler, Pennsylvania, where they had state and local law enforcement in one place and the Secret Service in another. So, you know, it's really not necessarily, if you had come to me previously and asked me if this needed to be fixed, I would have told you no, because it's been done so many times over and over again. I think they just need to step their game up. They need to provide the resources necessary to the threat. They need to make sure communications are in step with one another. State and locals understand what's being requested of them at all of these locations and motorcade routes. And, you know, the Secret Service will go on, but I think they realize some easy stuff is getting missed here, and it's endangering a lot of people. Yeah. Well, wow, Charles, I'd, I'd return it to the Treasury Department, where it seemed to be a lot better. The, the Department of Homeland Security is a huge mess of a bureaucracy. Charles, we'll have you back. Thank I you agree. so much.